Also running for seat C is Dean Williams. Thanks for having us and thank you for tuning in. Um, I appreciate uh, you taking interest in this uh, the school board and so thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Dean Williams. I, um, I've been approaching this campaign as if, I'm, as if I'm running for a job and you are hiring me. And I think there's two things that I hope you look at because I've interviewed a lot of people myself that I've interviewed a lot of people and the things that I would look at in a candidate are these two things. The first is integrity and the second is competency. And integrity matters a lot, I think, in any seat that someone's running for, but especially for an education system as large as ours with as much responsibility as we have. And so if you get to know me and find out who I am, I think you'll find that I'm a man of integrity and we can talk a little bit about that, of course. Um, but the second thing issued in terms of competency, I think you'll find me a very viable candidate in that regards too. I was the former superintendent of McLaughlin Youth Center. I have a 31 year state career that I retired from a little over a year and a half ago. Education has been a primary component of my, um, uh, of my last 10 years in my career and uh, I can talk to you more about that as you get to know me but um, I'm hoping that not only you hear what we say as candidates but you really look behind that and look at our records and reason why we're in front of you and why we're running for the seat that we are. So thanks for having me and thanks for tuning in. All right, uh, you're a newcomer. Um, why did you decide to run for school board now? Well, th there's several things, I guess. Um, uh, the first thing, I think everything in my career kind of has brought me to the place where I'm at right now. Um, I focused a lot of, on education in the last 10 years of my career, and the reason why is, is that as a juvenile justice superintendent, I realized if you want to keep kids out of trouble, out of jail, um, education is a key component to that. The second thing is, is that that's not only true for, um, uh, by the way, those, those, you know, in terms of juvenile justice issues, but also adult uh, criminals too, because our jails are full of uh, people that are, mm -hmm. have uh, not completed high school right. or have run into trouble, and, um, uh, and that is a way of tamping down our adult prison population. The other reason is, is that I really have a, a budget and a management experience that I think that um, some of the other candidates don't have. Um, I was the only superintendent in juvenile justice history to actually close down uh, a unit at McLaughlin Youth Center to reallocate resources and funds. And the reason why that's important is because there are difficult decisions I think we have in front of us in terms of the school district. And so being able to look at a very large budget and, and wrestle with what to do with cost overruns, we're, we're laying off uh, positions now we have in the last two years and the future doesn't look a whole much better. And I think you need people in the, in the room that have a um, their game on in terms of uh, management and uh, uh, budget part, part of it. The other last thing is that um, graduation rates as is, uh, for me has been a lifelong, well, a last passion for me in the last 10 years because um, I also realized that um, kids not graduating in our public school system, and I started working on this 10 years ago, long before 90% by 2020 ever became a goal or before it was ever mentioned. Many of us in the juvenile justice arena were working to develop uh, improving graduation rates. And so I developed an expulsion suspension school about, it's in its fifth year of operation now, and it's saving kids diplomas as we speak. So I just haven't advocated for those things. I've actually taken action and developed a school, and quite frankly, in the face of quite a bit of resistance, and it's, it's a model program. I've lectured on it. I've written about it. And so for a whole combination of reasons, um, uh, including those, that's the reason why I'm running now. And what's the name of that school? I had never heard of that before. It's, it's called Step Up, um, and um, it took about two years to develop, and it's 50 year of operations downtown in the mm -hmm. Sunshine Mall. Um, and it's the kids that are getting kicked out of school and uh, that the district has determined it's to hazardous to have in school and quite frankly the juvenile justice system would never even approach these kids because they're really not serious enough and so um, it really was feel, feeling a need in terms of addressing kids that were getting in trouble uh, and it's the reason why quite frankly our graduation rates have improved over the last few years hmm. because of that program and other efforts and that effort also started to tamp down and get have us get more sensible about how why we're expelling and suspending kids because that is a high risk uh, endeavor for if kids get expelled or suspended while they're not graduating. All right, the school district has had to cut millions of dollars over the past few years and just this year it was 23 million, I think 20, about 25 million the year before. They're having to make some really tough choices. Um, do you think the district's response to these cuts is adequate or would you do things differently? Well, I wish we had never gotten in this spot. 
I wrote a piece in the Alaska Dispatch about two weeks ago on an op-ed piece on this very issue. I talked about what happened in juvenile justice, my own agency, about um, how costs got ramped up, how grant-funded positions no longer were grant-funded, and you start rolling these uh, into your operating costs. And that's what's happened with the school district. What's also happened with the school district is they've added multiple uh, you know, extra space. We have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of extra square footage, and that drives your op and those all drive operational costs. So I would have preferred not to have us get into the financial pickle that we find ourselves in, and that could have been avoidable. It just mm -hmm. could have been. That's all water under the bridge, as they say. So we're at where we're at now. What do we do? I think I would do. Um, some of the actions taken are absolutely appropriate. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no choice right now. However, uh, teaching positions uh, would be the last to go in my book. Now, I know that's easier said than done. I know there's lots of nuances to this entire conversation. There's no magic pill for unwinding how we got ourselves into this place. However, I think um, a complete review of where we're spending money, where positions have been added over the last 10 years, some of that has been done. I think that I would push for that to be done far more extensively because we got ourselves into this because certain grant-funded positions and certain expenses have been lopped on and been added on. And, and unwinding ourselves from that is going to take a bit of time, but it's really going to take a lot of focus as well. Governor Parnell's proposal to raise the base student allocation uh, by $85 the per student, it's $85 over three years, it's the per student funding that the district gets. Um, do you think that's adequate or do you think it should be more? I would, I would advocate for a little more than what Governor Parnell has been suggesting. Um, but let me, let me say this, the school district, uh, as a board member, you don't have control over the amount of money you get. Mm -hmm. regardless of what some people would like in regards to that. Um, so I, I'm certainly going to advocate for uh, what I think, you know, along with other, my other colleagues and after some, you know, debate over this, I would certainly advocate for more BSA funding than what Governor Parnell has requested. That said, um, what the school district does have control over is spending. Um, and I think that we've had a bit of a spending problem in the school district. No disrespect to people that are on the seat right now. Um, but a big part of the community is, is feeling that, and I kind of feel that too. That doesn't mean that you blow things up or that you shut everything down to make a point. And maybe some of this whole issue of the, of the BSA has been a bit of a political football in some regards, right? I mean, I think that's really possible. <laughs> um, but even if it is or isn't, um, uh, I would certainly allocate, advocate for more of the BSA, but at the same time, my focus is going to be in getting our financial house order. What we do have control over is the school district. What we do have control over is spending. What do you think about the $400 or so that the school board chair has said would be adequate to start? this year, effort raising the base student allocation by about $400. Well, that's what, that's what the, the makeup cost on that is, right? right. Is that's basically the amount that's been... Would you vote for that? Would you support oh, that? Oh, I would, I, would I would support it. I, what, I, what, what bothers me a little bit about this conversation is that the school district's job, the school board member's job, is to allocate and spend money as wisely as possible, right? Advocating for an increase in the BSA should be about 10% of our work, 5%, 1% mm -hmm. of the work maybe. Mm -hmm. And I know that the way that a lot of the budget, without getting into the intricacies of the way the budget is set up and the unknowns and amount, it really complicates the ability for school board members and administration to predict what costs are going to be because they're not sure what, you know, they, I mean, predict what revenue they're going to be getting. It's not a good system. It's not a clean system. So I would certainly say, oh, sure, give us as much money as we want, I suppose. I mean, but the reality is it doesn't make much sense. I mean, I would like for us to get spending under control and then negotiate with the governor and other members of the legislature and the community, for that matter, to say, you know what, it's somewhere between 80 some dollars and $400. That's a finer nuanced conversation. I'm more interested in getting spending under control. All right. So if the BSA isn't raised, which, which could happen too. Um, how would you prioritize budget cuts if you're elected? I would look at every grant-funded position and grant-funded activity that came on board in the last 10 years um, that has been now rolled into the budget. There are some tough decisions we have to make. Um, I'm a sort of a law enforcement guy. I'm part of the Council of State Government School Discipline Consensus Project. We have a report coming out as part of the law enforcement subcommittee. 
The SRO program, I'm very familiar with. Um, I've, I've talked about the SRO program. I'm in this national group. We've had multiple discussions about the value of the SRO program. The reality is the cost of the SRO program is $3 million where we're laying off teachers. What's SRO just for people I'm, who don't I'm know. sorry about that. School resource officer. So it's cops in the schools. And I've known most of the sergeants that have headed that up. Uh, the chief and I, uh, Chief Mew and I have, back in the day, 10 years ago when he was working for the school district, we we talked a lot about school safety issues. We, kn we knew that this was a great program in many ways, but it was going to cost. So that's one example. I'm not out saying today, as of this day, that I would, I would whack that program, but I'm saying those, all I would look at is every grant funded position, and there are multiple ones that have come on. And so to unwind yourself, I think the school district has to spend multiple days, weeks effort to say, okay, here are the positions. That's one example of one program I'd look close at. Let's talk about personnel costs, because we know that personnel costs and, and benefits in particular have been really driving the budget up. They've, they've been going up. It's been reported to, that they've been rising as much as 18% in a year. Um, what are your ideas for controlling and managing that? The biggest one the school district has mentioned, um, and it's right, has been the, um, um, is the health care cost. Uh, if you look at what their, excuse me, their, their um, data says it's about 9%, 9.6% every year. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways, and when I was working for the state, I actually negotiated for the supervisor unit as a negotiator of two different sessions. One of the things we looked at was how do you bring down um, uh, health insurance cost? Because even if you can just bring it down 1% or 2%, the number of employees and how that spreads out really actually starts to make an impact on costs. So I'm for employees having a robust uh, benefits, robust pay, um, and, and, and all of the things that come along with that of attracting the best and the brightest. Um, but even if you can make one gain on health insurance costs, which I have been a, I have been a part of, not personally, but overseen as a negotiator, you know the state and the unions worked on trying to bring down cost is because the benefit of just getting that down one or two percent gained a great deal. So that, in terms of it and uh, benefits, that's one way I would try to leverage uh, driving costs down. As the largest district in the state, do you think ASD should have more control over their budget? They don't have a whole lot of control over it right now. They have control over it, well, unless you're talking about... I mean uh, how much uh, money they get. So <laughs> the legislature <laughs> right. gives them money, right? The assembly's right. capped off at the amount they can contribute. Right. I mean, it would mean ch changing the funding system and structure. Are you for that, or do you think it should just stay the way it is? Uh, I'm, not for, I'm not for that when you have the sort of cost drivers that we've had. All due respect to the prior administration and prior school board members. Our costs have gone up way over inflation. From last approximately 10 years ago, this budget was a little over $400 million. It's a little over $800 million. We're going to hit a billion dollars very soon. I go back to, I think we have a spending problem. That doesn't, like everybody out there, I mean, we want a robust and a healthy public education system. I have two grandchildren going in, you know, one's in, one's going into the school. I mean, it matters a great deal. This is the, li this is the integrity and life of our, of our community education, I think. But we have to get a control on spending. So I don't think the answer right now is giving us a blank check to say, uh, let's see if you can fix it with more money right now. We do need more money, but we also need spending controls. How about uh, performance? The Common Core Standards were introduced in 2012. We're just starting to see those play out in classrooms. Are those working for us? Do you think they were a good addition? Uh, well, they haven't really officially started yet, but the, uh, the, that train has sort of left the station in mm -hmm. terms of, I mean, the school board's voted for it, they've approved it. My position on Common Core is I'm not an anti-Common Core guy. I've had several concerns with Common Core, which I, I, I won't be able to get into, too, but those two basic concerns are, one, it's going to continue to drive costs up significantly because the bandwidth, the loan issues of doing Common Core and just all the mm -hmm. expenses associated with are not going to be cheap. It's a cost driver. The second thing about Common Core is, is that it doesn't address the, the, one of the major issues for me in terms of the public education system. There needs to be multiple tracks in multiple different ways. The education system we had 30 years ago I think is different. And so that is, I think some of those things need to change and that's the reason why I'm not sure Common Core is the, the end all to everything. Okay, thank you. That was Dean Williams, candidate for school board seat C. Those are the three candidates running for seat C, Pat Higgins, Liz Ross, and Dean Williams. After the break, we'll be back with the candidates for school board seat D.